Okay, we're at lecture 18, Hardy Weinberg Equilibrium. Uh, I know that a lot of you struggled very badly in second year um, with this uh, idea of Hardy Weinberg. You got it in first year, you got it in second year. So now we're getting in third year and you're thinking, I prof, but I know, I know this already. Well, most of you don't. Okay, that's why you're still doing second year. Those who passed can say that they know it, but this is third year. Okay, and so we're going to go into a bit more detail. And the questions are going to be more detailed. It's not going to be like second year where everything is easy. All right, so let's continue. Um, I'm calling it, and everybody actually calls the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium a null model for population genetics. A null model for population genetics. In other words, you will see Hardy Weinberg equilibrium when you have no evolution okay you i think you all get that from second year but i wanted to repeat it and i will repeat it a, a, quite a few times today all right so how do we model evolution to model something you need mathematics and you need formulas all right so and that is the first you when you model something in biology it's the f or in any science it's the first step to proving that this thing is real it's not a fantasy it's not fiction it's not a fairy tale it's real okay if you can't model it you can't measure it well it's a fantasy all right everything else is a fantasy so modeling evolution you're like ah I'm not how the hell do you model something that's been going on for billions of years? It's easy, ladies and gentlemen, because it affects the population from one generation to the next. Remember the last lecture. The population is evolving, not the individual. So we just need to take a population and measure its allele frequency and then compare it to what we would expect if that population had no evolution. And then we will know if the population is evolving. So, um, <clears throat> none of us biologists, you know, are particularly good at maths, okay? But unfortunately, modern biology is, is very mathematical. So if you want to do postgrad in genetics with me, then you have to know maths and you have to know it very well. You'll be tested before you are accepted. You have to uh, really know what you're doing uh, when you when you do genetics these days because it's very, very heavily mathematical and it's very heavily model-driven. But that's post-grad. You don't have to worry about that. Okay, right now. We are just dealing with third year. So now, those two guys you see in the picture there, one is Hardy <laughs> and the other one is Weinberg right it, and they're black and white pictures why because it was a long time ago before color pictures came so um jeffrey hardy was an english guy and and weinberg was a german and both of them figured out that you can expect uh, evolution to be happening in all the populations all the time because if you think about it when is evolution not happening, right? We are always in the process of struggling to survive, finding a, a, a mate, having kids, and passing the genes to the next generation. We are, that's a constant process that's happening day in, day out. So that is why these guys, Hardy and Weinberg, said, well, actually, evolution should be happening all the time. All the time. Okay? In all populations. And... How is that possible? Well, one clue is to look at what causes the allele frequencies in the population to change. Now, when I in, in the last lecture when I said, oh, Big B went from 0 0.9 to 0 0.2 between one generation and the next, that means evolution has happened, right? Sure, we got that. But... But what? What exactly made the frequency change? Oh, we know it was evolution, but what? What force of evolution made it change? Okay? 
And that's where, that's where we're going with this Heidi Weinberg. We want to figure out what things, that are hap what things happen in the population that cause the frequency to change. All right? So the simplest, simplest model, which is a null, what, that is what a null model is, the simplest model, right? A null model, the simplest model would be to assume that there is no evolution. Okay? Just assume that evolution doesn't happen. This is the way that half of South Africa thinks anyway. Evolution doesn't happen. Okay, so let's start with that. That's a good starting point because most people believe that, right? So let's start with that. Evolution never occurred, right? So in other words, what does that mean? Based on what you already know that I've taught you. That means that the, that the allele frequency in a population will never change from one generation to the next. That is what you are saying. When you say evolution, there's no such thing. It's not occurring. That means you are saying there is never going to be a change in the allele frequency from one generation to the next generation. Okay? Because if there's a change, something is causing the frequency to change. And that is what? Evolution. Right? So it's very simple. This is why we all laugh when people say there's no evolution. Uh, it's, very, it's, it's ridiculously simple. Right? So in order to, for evolution never to occur, what would we need? In other words, if we want the LA frequencies to never change from one generation to the next, what will we need in, in, in this population? What will we need? We will need no new mutations. As soon as you get a mutation, you have another allele, right? Mutation creates alleles. So you've got another allele. That means the frequency of the first allele is going to change because now you've got another allele in the population, right? So that can't happen. Allele frequency can't change, remember. If there is... If no evolution means the allele frequency can't change, that means mutation cannot happen, right? What else cannot happen? Natural selection must never be able to happen. Because why? Natural selection will choose the fit allele. So in the next generation, you will see a higher frequency of what? The fitter allele. And the unfit allele will, be, will, will not make it to the next generation. So you will see a change in allele frequency with natural selection. But that means what? Natural selection must never occur. That's why you will get... No, that's the where you will get no change in allele frequency. But not just natural selection never occurring, mutation also must never occur. Okay? And also, you need a population that is infinitely large. Why? What force of evolution are we tackling with this third one? infinitely large population obviously you guys are so clever genetic drift you're right because you know that genetic drift affects based on population size if the size is small drift is going to change the allele frequency it's going to hammer those alleles it's going to pull out alleles of the population left right and center you will have completely different alleles in the next generation when your population is small so evolution genetic drift causes evolution it causes serious evolution when the population size is small. So for genetic drift to never cause, an, cause evolution, to never change the allele frequency, how big must the population be? That's right. You clever ones. It must be infinitely large. Okay? That is why we have here number three. We need an infinitely large population for evolution to never occur due to genetic drift. All right? What about the fourth one? All the members of a population breed. Come on. Is that true? Do every individual, does every individual breed? You know that there's a struggle to breed thanks to sexual selection. You know that there's a struggle. And, and there's a variance in mating success. So not everyone is going to breed. Okay? So... In order for no evolution to occur, that means the allele frequency has to be the same in this generation and the next generation the same. You can't have some breeding and some not breeding. Right? You have to have everyone breeding. Everybody has to breed. So that they, all their alleles go to the next generation and there's no change in the frequency. If even one of them does not breed, the allele frequency in that next generation is going to change. Okay? So everybody has to breed for no evolution to occur. Immediately you can see, ha, huh, how is that going to happen? So what about random mating? Okay? Totally random mating. So that means, again, having to do with breeding. Uh, 
uh, there is no selection of your mate. So the first one you see, you mate, you have kids. Okay, that normally doesn't happen, especially with humans. But uh, that's saying that you cannot have any sexual selection. That means you can't look. Ah, oh, that one is an attractive one. I'm gonna go with that one. There's no. You cannot have sexual selection. Sexual selection. What is it going to do? You. You. Okay. Let's see. What is it going to do in the population? Right. So we have a population. You have some attractive and some unattractive. Now you're coming and you're saying, ah, I want to mate only with the attractive one. Do you think you're the only one who wants to mate with the attractive one? All the others also want to mate with the attractive one. That means what? The attractive ones alleles are going to go to the next generation. The ugly ones alleles are going to stay here in this generation. That means the ugly and the attractive, they're both not giving their genes to the next generation. So the next generation, the allele frequencies are changed. Therefore, there's evolution. That is what sexual selection, that is how sexual selection causes evolution. It chooses the most beautiful alleles to go to the next generation. So if you have no change in allele frequency, you can't have any choosing of mates. No sex, sexual selection, right? So um, what about the number of offspring? No? Everybody, if I have one child and you have three children, and that one has five children. Whose alleles are going to be more in the next generation? Obvious, the one with five. Then you, then me last. I will have the smallest frequency. Right? So, unless everybody produces exactly the same number of kids, the ones who produce more kids are going to have more alleles in the next generation. Right? So, if you don't have all the same kid, number of kids, the next generation is going to have different allele frequencies. Okay? So that's another thing that must happen if the if an evolution must never occur. So how about uh, gene flow? How about gene flow? The other force of evolution, one of the other forces of evolution. So far we've been dealing with mutation, okay? We've been dealing with selection here. We've been dealing with genetic drift there, number three. Uh, here we are dealing with sexual selection and selection. Here again we're dealing with sexual selection. Uh, everyone produces the same number of offspring what force of evolution is that that is again selection and then no migration in and out of the population what is migration doing to the population so if you have a population here and it's going to the next generation but now you have migration coming another person is coming from outside they have brought new alleles the allele frequency is not going to be the same between the new generation and the old generation so gene flow also causes evolution by changing the frequency of the allele between uh, 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 population allele frequency between two generations. Okay, so you will need all seven of these things to be true in order to go out and say confidently with pride there is no such thing as evolution. If only one of them is not true, that argument is finished. You can't make that argument, not, not intelligently anyway, right? So you need all these seven things to be happening in order for no evolution to happen. And you look at even one of those things and you, you, say, you will say to yourself, just look at any random one and you will say to yourself, Mar Prof, we all know that is, that's impossible. We all know that it's impossible to have an infinitely large population. Prof, it's impossible that all the members are breeding. It's impossible that everybody has the same number of kids. It's impossible. Every one of these things is impossible. Okay? And all of them must happen for no evolution. So do you see how possible evolution is as a result of that? Okay. So in the real world, all of these, these things actually do happen. And they happen all the time. And so basically what we, are, what we have is what Hardy and Weinberg said at the start. All populations are evolving all the time because of these seven things here. All right. You will be asked about these seven things. I usually, in second year, I like to ask you to match the four forces of evolution with these seven here. So then you have to say selection. It's uh, number uh, number two and number... Da, 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 da. Uh, 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 mutation is... Da, uh, uh, genetic drift is number three, right? Infinitely large population. That's what you had to do in second year, to mix and match, okay? And most of you bungled that up badly. 
So you might even get the same question in a test this year. Right. So if evolution never occurred, the allele frequencies would not change, right? From one generation to the next, and therefore they would be in equilibrium. That's what we mean by equilibrium. Okay? When there's no change, there is an equilibrium. Okay. And this equilibrium is called a the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. When there is no change in allele frequency between one generation and the next. Okay, so there is a formula, right? There is a formula that describes this Hardy Weinberg equation. And this is the one of the most famous formulas in biology because it is relating two very important things the genotype frequency that means how many heterozygotes and how many of the two homozygotes do we have in our population that's the genotype frequency the frequency of each genotype and homozygote and heterozygotes are genotypes and it relates those to allele frequency and allele frequency is not the same as genotype frequency. Remember, genotype frequency to work out, you divide by the number of individuals. Allele frequency to work out, you collect all the alleles from all the genotypes and you divide by that gene pool, which is the number of individuals times two. So they are not the same thing. But this equation brings both allele frequencies and genotype frequencies into the same formula. In other words, it, is, it tells us what the relationship is between genotype frequency and allele frequency. And you know, you know, you know that it's P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared is equal to 1. So that means if you add all the genotypes, here the homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessives, you add all of them and they will be equal to 1. Okay, just like P plus Q is equal to 1. Right, so if the genotype frequencies are disturbed in one generation, they have to return to equilibrium after one generation of random breeding. That is how the Heidi Weinberg theory goes. Okay, so what you want to do is actually figure out what the allele frequencies are, you want to figure out what the genotype frequencies are, and then you compare the genotype frequencies with what you actually observe. Okay, so the genotype frequencies you work out uh, using the Hardy Weinberg formula, those are the genotype frequencies. Okay, those are uh, then used to figure out the allele frequencies. All right, so you want to figure out um, the relationship between these two allele frequencies and genotype frequencies. So let us try and derive Hardy and Weinberg's equation uh, using just some simple high school maths. Most of you, or all of you had to pass high school maths. That's why you're sitting here. So please don't let me down. Uh, let us deal with the simplest case. One population, we will always be dealing with one popular, with, 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 with one gene and two alleles. So bi allelic system, a big A, small A, or big B, small B, right? Only two alleles. So big A and small A. Big A is dominant, small A is recessive. P is the frequency of big A, Q is the frequency of small A. And if we know the genotypes, how many heterozygotes and homozygotes, basically, that's the number of, that's the genotypes, how do we calculate the allele frequencies? Well, you know how to do this already, right? We've gone through the worked example in the last lecture. To work out the allele frequency of P, you take, you collect all the big A's and you add that to half the big A's from the heterozygotes, right? And then you divide it by, and you you have to divide it by the gene pool. Q is you collect all the small A's, small A's, and you add half the small A's from the heterozygotes. Okay, and P plus Q then is equal to one, okay, in, because there are only two alleles in the gene pool. All right, so let's make a Punnett square, okay? If we separate things out in terms of males and females and both heterozygote, Okay, you will see here how you can get big A, big A, big A, small A, big A, small A again, and then small A, small A. Okay, and you can see that all of them must equal one. Right, 
So we know that they must equal 1. Homozygous plus heterozygous must equal 1. So now let's read the genotypes from the Punnett square. All right. So we basically, uh, it's the same Punnett square as in the last slide. Okay. So there's is this way to do it here. And then there's this way to do it here. But they're both exactly the same. So we take males and females, both heterozygous. Okay. And we say, okay, what uh, uh, you're giving an A allele, right? This one is giving an A allele. We have two A alleles here. In other words, we have two P's, okay? And that's where you get P times P here with the two A's, and that's P squared, okay? So you have P there and P there, two P's, and you get in this block, because the two P's come together, you get P squared. So then let's look at the block where the two Q's come together. That's with the recessive allele, the small a's, small a. Yeah, that's Q, right? And the two Q's come together here in this block, and that's Q squared. So now let's look at the other two blocks that we haven't looked at yet. This, these two, and this, this one here, and this one here. So here, what is happening? Uh, a small a is coming together with a big A, and you have P, which is a small a, which is a big a, sorry, and multiplied by Q, which is the small a. So it's P and Q are coming together here. Okay? But what's happening here? Here, you get Q and P. So Q and P, P and Q, they're the same. It doesn't matter in multiplication whether you say 2 times 3 or 3 times 2. It's the same product. Okay? So this is actually the same thing, and that's why we have 2PQ. Okay? That's why we have 2PQ. Okay? So let's look at that in this way here. In this block here, what do we have? P times P, P squared. In this block here, what do we have? Q times Q, Q squared. And in these two blocks, what do we have? PQ plus QP. PQ plus QP is equal to 2PQ. And that is how you derive the hardy weinberg formula, just with a simple Punnett square. All right. This is how the formula relates genotype frequencies to allele frequencies. This is a very important graph, ladies and gentlemen. You should really, really, really understand what this graph is all about because this graph is going to be very important for practical 6, 7, and 8. We are going to look at graphs like this. We're going to look at allele frequencies. Actually, we're going to look at the P allele, the, uh, the, the, this one here. The P allele, the red one, is what we're going to look at. We don't need to look at the Q because we know if P is going up, Q must be going down. Okay, here's P in red, here's Q in blue. Whoopsie, sorry. So P is the allele frequency of P, right? Here it is zero, here it is one. You, you have to follow my mouse, guys. You have to follow my mouse. P is zero here and one here. Q is one here and zero there. Okay, so while P is busy going up, Q is busy going down. Okay, and when you have P is equal to 0 0.5, whoopsie, again, 0 0.5 there, what is Q equal to? 0 0.5, because P plus Q must equal to 1. So wherever you go here, you go to that point. What is P? 0 0.6. What must Q be? You don't, need, you, don't need to, you don't need to look at Q here to see that it's 0. Point, what is it? Here, at this point, P is 0 0.75. At that very point, Q is 0 0.25. Okay, so basically, 7.75 plus 0.25 is equal to 1, right? At any two points here, you got P is equal to 0 0.1 here. P is equal to 0 0.1. At the very same place, what is Q equal to? You don't, you don't need to be a magician. It's equal to 0 0.9, okay? Because P plus Q is always equal to 1. But look at the genotypes, okay? Look at the genotypes. If we have 60% of, here's the genotype frequency. Here's the allele frequency. The y-axis is a genotype frequency. So if we have P squared is equal to 0 0.6, right? So then... What must Q squared be? Under hardy weinberg equilibrium, Q squared will be, you go down to the Q there. And it must be something 
very low below 0 0.1 and then what are the heterozygotes for that same spot at, at, at 0 0.6 for p 0 0.6 q is below 0 0.1 and what is 2pq 2pq is the green line here 2pq will be yeah, 0 0.3 something okay so these are the genotype frequencies you would expect if your population was in hardy weinberg equilibrium so if i gave you uh, the allele frequency P and I said um, here's the here's the genotype of, of, of frequency oh here's the frequency P of the uh, big allele what is the frequency of the small allele you will minus from one you will get Q right but what if I asked you for example well we have so many heterozygotes, so many homozygotes. Uh, are they in hardy weinberg equilibrium? What will you have to do? You will have to work out, take those heterozygotes and homozygotes, work out the allele frequency. Then you will take that allele frequency, put it into the hardy weinberg formula, and get what? These values here for the genotype frequencies. And these values, so for example, if you worked out the frequency was uh, 0 0.7, for p that's this p 0 0.7 so under hardy weinberg equilibrium we would ex what would, would our expected genotypes be remember observed genotypes are what the ones that you see with your eyes it's given to you in the in the question there are prep plenty of problems like this in pra in, in practical five now nah? so you will you will need to understand this and so when I give you an allele frequency, when you figure out the allele frequency is 0 0.7 of, say, P, then you can say, okay, fine. That means under hardy weinberg equilibrium, my, I should have, and look, there's 7, and so where does 0 0.7 hit the recessive homozygotes? We should have then, we should have about 0 0.1 or less, homozygote recessives under hardy weinberg expectation expected homozygote recessives when the frequency is 0 0.7 how many heterozygotes do we have we have ex we can expect just over 0.4 heterozygotes okay genotype frequency of 0 0.4 and if we have 0 0.7 p is equal to 0 0.7 how many homozygotes can we expect slightly more about zero close closer getting closer closer to 0 0.5 Okay, so these tell you for any given allele frequency, what is the expectation if the population is, is under hardy weinberg equilibrium? In other words, what will we expect if the population is not evolving? Okay, that's what we want when we ask you to calculate the expected genotype frequencies under hardy weinberg equilibrium. Okay, there are problems. You will have to deal with them in your practical guide about exactly this thing. All right. So I've just explained for the last 10 minutes why this is useful. So to be honest, you should know already. But having a null model like this is extremely useful because when we observe that the allele frequencies are changing, okay, when we observe uh, we can predict what we would see when there is no evolution. That's very important to know. We can predict. If I gave you an, two allele frequencies, you can figure out if there's no evolution. So, in other words, under hardy weinberg equilibrium, what can I expect genotype frequencies to be? You can work that out using that graph or the formula, right? You need to be able to work that out. So if I give you observed genotypes, what do you have to do? You have to work out the genotype frequencies for all those genotypes. Then you have to work out the allele frequency for P and Q. Then you have to take those allele frequencies and put them into the hardy weinberg formula to work out the expected genotypes, expected heterozygosity, expected uh, homozygotes. And then you do a chi-square test between observed and expected to see if there is a significant difference. If there's a significant difference between observed and expected, it means your population has undergone evolution. In other words, we reject the null hypothesis. 
that the population is not evolving. Okay, we reject the null hypothesis that the population is in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. In other words, not evolving. All right, I cannot explain that any 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 more simpler than that. Okay, if you can, if you find a difference between a significant difference, if you do a chi square, and you go, you find a significant difference between observed and expected. You reject the null model. Okay, you reject the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. You say, no, it's not applying to my population. My population is evolving. All right, so that is what I'm going to explain one last time very quickly here. Okay, so now I've given you these genotypes, observed genotypes. These are what you see with your eyes when you go to the field. We 16 big A, big A's, 20 big A heterozygotes. Uh, and only four small a, small a, total of 40, right? That's all I'm going to give you. And I'm going to say, is this population in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium? Figure it out. What do you have to do? You have to take these guys here, these numbers. You've got to work out P and Q, okay? Look how they worked out P, 52 divided by 80, 28 divided by 80 for Q. There's the allele frequencies. How did they get 52? Come on, guys. How did they get 52? They doubled this because there's for the P, it's for big A, right? 16 times 2, 32, plus 20. You have to take this 20 because half of them are big A, right? That's 52 divided by 80. What about the small A? You've got four, but you have to, you've got two sets of four. So you, you've got eight small alleles here with these homozygotes. Plus 20, 4 plus 20, uh, 8 plus 20 is 28 divided by 80. 0. So you first must get P and Q. You are given this, the very first thing, and you are told to figure out, is this population in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, right? So the first thing you do is you have to get P and Q, because you can't go anywhere if you don't have P and Q. Then you work out P and Q like this. Then you put that 0 0.65 and 0 0.35 P and Q into this Hardy Weinberg formula, 2P squared plus 2PQ is equal to plus Q squared, uh, Q squared, that should be Q squared there, sorry, is equal to one, right? So you put it into the formula and look, you get the genotype frequencies, okay? You get the expected genotype frequencies and then you multiply that with 40, which is the total number of individuals to get the expected number of individuals with that genotype, okay? So actually, now we've got observed genotypes that's the number we actually see with our eyes and this expected genotypes we calculated based on the allele frequency and the hardy weinberg formula we calculated these and these are the number of individual genotypes we would see if our population was not evolving if it was under hardy weinberg so now what do we do we've got the observed We've got now the expected because we worked it out. And now what do we do? We check if there's a deviation between observed and expected. And the way we do that is to use a chi-square. And you will have to do that in your, in, your, um, in your practical guide. Okay, so now we have a null model that describes if the equilibrium be between allele frequencies in, in, in population between one generation and the next if there's no evolution right so now that we have this we can actually measure how much evolution is occurring okay so a strong deviation from hardy weinberg equilibrium will mean there's a lot of evolution and the opposite for a weak deviation how about we can find out what processes are causing the allele frequencies to change what force or forces are making the populations deviate from hardy weinberg equilibrium you know this already because they're the very forces that don't have to be occurring for no evolution to occur. Those seven that I put before, they must occur, okay? Those are the ones that are making the population deviate from Hardy Weinberg, okay? And they're caused by new mutations, they're caused by mutations becoming under natural selection, they're caused by finite population sizes, genetic drift, they're caused by uh, all no, the fact that not everybody is breeding, okay? Mating is not random, okay? People select their partners. There is sexual selection. There is going to cause allele frequencies to change in the next generation, okay? Not all the members are producing the same number of offspring. 
Okay, that is what's causing these Hardy Weinberg expectations to change. And lastly, there is migration in and out, and that could also cause a deviation from Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. So all these things are basically what? They are the forces of evolution, right? And they are the ones causing a deviation from Hardy Weinberg. Hardy Weinberg is saying, uh uh, I corner, there's no evolution. And then you compare observed. Observed is what you see. That's what's happening. Expected is when there's no evolution, this is what we expect. And you compare what is happening to what you expect under Hardy Weinberg and do a chi squared. And if there's a significant difference, voila, you can say, and you can stand proudly. Nobody can ever say otherwise that my population is evolving. All right. So there are the four forces that cause Hardy Weinberg equilibrium are caused by mutation. And that is what? new no new mutations the second one is selection these mutations are under natural selection then there's sexual selection not all the members breed not all the members have the same offspring okay i suppose uh not all the members breed because maybe there was an accident right not necessarily because of selection because if there was an accident for some random accident and and someone dies and they don't breed that doesn't fall under selection that should fall under that should fall under genetic drift. Anything that's random falls under genetic drift. So you can put this one here. Not all members breed. You can put uh, you can put that. And even this one, not all members of the same produce the same number of offspring. Both of those can fall under selection, like I've done here. But they can also fall under drift. Okay. Here under drift, I've put only that the population size is finite. The influence of random chance will be bigger as the population gets smaller, as you, as you already know, right? But also random chance, these two here, you could also technically have leave them under selection, but put them also under drift. And gene flow, obviously, is the last one, migration in, in and out of the population. All right. So if you have any questions about that, please let me know via Blackboard. If not, I will see you uh, at the next lecture.